have casual conversations and 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 to be able to go out to coffee runs together you can't yeah it's so important though yeah yeah or have lunch or dinner together you know have drinks together because sometimes they pause it doesn't mean they finish what they want to say like (laughs) they're just processing in there right you need to also think about how do they how how to help them to develop the career uh not just the product because that would be very selfish thing to do hello friends and welcome to shuya's interview this corner is a show about tech career and work in a Japanese company. As you guys know, I'm your host Shuya and please enjoy the video today. On the show, we have a special guest Eric. He's working as a head of product in a Japanese company, but actually he's working remotely from Hong Kong and managing people from various countries. So today, I asked a bunch of questions about work in a Japanese company and work as a pro- head of product. Thankfully, he gave us a lot of experience in his career, so I hope you guys enjoy it and learn from it. All right, now let's get started. Before the question, um, could you introduce yourself briefly, like your profile or career path or uh, a, a role in the company? Sure, I can. Um, so my name's Eric. I am working in a company, a very cool company, I think, called Woven Planet Holdings. Um, it is the software arm of the Toyota Group, and it was formed. Well, the company was formed in 2021, but actually, um, uh, the the foundation of it was formed a few more years back. And um, it really had caught my eye the last couple of years in terms of the leadership team and and the mission and and vision. Um, which is really to really to drive that happiness for all um, mentality, um, but but driving it through delivering the same quality, the same Toyota quality and reliability uh, in terms of software rather than just in automotive sector. So, um, Woven Planet is a really big company. Um, they have different uh, units that uh, looks at robotics. Uh, um, automated driving for sure, um, and different kinds of software ecosystem that will surround uh, the Toyota Group. Um, but I'm working on a project called Dojo that is uh, building currently uh, a B2B learning platform or upskilling platform, which I think uh, is another very exciting opportunity for both the company and the Japanese market in general. So I'm the head of product there. <laughs> Okay, that's great. So, is that is your company is like a subsidiary of Toyota? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That, that's a, so that's Japanese company, right? Yeah, it is. It's fully owned by Toyota. Yep. Okay. All right. So let's jump right into the first question. Uh, okay. The topic is like, what's it like working in a Japanese company? And, Ooh, uh, okay. And yeah. my question is, why did you decide? to join a Japanese company? Very, very interesting question. Um, I didn't know what I, I would expect because I, I knew only one or two people who have been to Japan and they only worked there for a couple of years. They didn't really live there for a long time. Um, so I haven't, haven't been in the company now for three weeks, like literally. I can, I, can honest, I, I can honestly say the culture is actually quite Silicon Valley-like. Um, I think it's a, it's a really beautiful hybrid of um, you've got like 50%, almost, like from, from my point of view, the people I interact with. So half of them will be local Japanese. But a lot of those Japanese um, employees themselves also worked across a lot of international companies, either in, in inside Japan or out, out of Japan themselves. And also the other half, kind of like me, who are uh, foreigners or expatriates, and, and we brought in a different point of view or a different uh, diversity of thought into the company. And that is amazing because um, you don't come across a lot of the companies that um, really try to drive that cross-cultural mentality um, in our day-to-day working. And as someone who, who's led in innovation and you don't even need that to, to, to show um, that diversity of thought 
and the diversity of employees really do help the team to to create a product that speaks to a wide spectrum of users, right? Like it will, if it was just you and me, sure, just on and, and to, to build product, we only can bring our own experiences, like the sum of two of us, to to build something that uh, may not necessarily target well to people that don't look, talk, or live like we do. So having that has been amazing, and it's actually a quite eye opener. I I really like it. So English is the primary language at Woven Planet Holdings, um, but at the same time. I, I feel humble because a lot of the foreigners speak very fluent Japanese. Oh, really? I only, yeah, I only know a very basic, very basic Japanese, but I'm learning uh, as well. It, it, I think um, that was such a great surprise, but at the same time, so beautiful, right? Because I also won't want to learn your language in order to understand the mindset and appreciate the culture. It's very important for me to work in a country like yours. Um, so I love it. I love it. It's only week three, and I can see that um, I'll be enjoying it for a long, long time. Um, and then I think your your second part of the question was um, around uh, what's what's like to work like in a Japanese company. Yeah, right? yeah. So it's not that different because my 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 job and my responsibility is something that. Um, fairly close to what I've done in the past, except it's in a completely different sector, and 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 maybe at a very early phase of the company as well. So the cool part is is that you don't necessarily get to enjoy working in a lot of greenfield projects, right, in your career, um, but being able to set up your own team from scratch and being able to uh, put together roadmaps from scratch is actually quite exciting. Um, and it's challenging, <laughs> mm, yeah. but but I, I guess an analogy is kind of like what you said before, sure. So it's that you love playing with Legos, right? You 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 have an idea, you have a dream, and you put together those those building blocks. Yeah, you know, often in our careers, you jump into different places, but those building blocks has already been built by other people, someone else. It's very rare you get to build build your own sort of foundational blocks. Mm-hmm. So that part I love. That part I love. And yeah, so far it's been great. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. Thank you. All right. So like you said, you the half of the people are working from other country, right? Yes. Yes. So so you, basically you uh, you guys are working uh, uh uh like remotely. Correct. So right now, um we we work remotely so the japanese local teams so the of course that includes um both the local japanese employees and also the foreigners living in japan they they are still majority of them working remotely because of covid um but i would say they probably will spend one to two days in the office in a week actually i think that's a pretty nice balance because it balances out the flexibility but also you sometimes do need one to two days in the office just to keep the culture alive and to to be able to have casual conversations and 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 to be able to go out to coffee runs together. You can't. Yeah, it's so important though. Home. Yeah. Yeah, or have lunch or dinner together. You know, have drinks together. You need that in a team. Um, so I'm glad uh, that I think it's quite built in that we don't want to be fully remote. Unless it's been, you know, something that the government needs us to be fully remote, or HR wants us to be fully remote, but I think the mentality is that uh, we can still go back to the office whenever we want. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's different. So I've, I'm working also with developers in the European area, and I'm quite used to that. Even in Hong Kong or even in Singapore, um, I'm very used to managing distributed teams from different time zones. Um, and and that's very uh, uh, it's not as challenging as some people think. I think the only challenging bit is making sure people feel like they're in the same team because of the different time zones. But we're very used to Slack. Um, we're very used to the way how agile development works. So everyone kind of have their own daily interactions, whether it's in written form or whether it's like what you and I do now in video form. And my job as the leader of the team is to make it fun. And, and as long as I can make the day-to-day fun enough, 
and and people actually feel like they found their purpose in building the product and I've done my job because um, I'm not myself, you know, building the product. I need the team to understand where the product is and then um, help them and guide them, gently guide them towards uh, um, uh, being creative pretty much. And uh, I've got a wonderful team. Mm, <laughs> so yeah. <I> <laughs> um, I thought it's interesting because uh, you're my, as a pro- head of product and you're managing yeah. people from other countries, right? Yeah. And, you yes. know, yeah, there are uh, time lags and we, so people can gather in one place, like for real. So it's yeah. kind of, I think it's kind of difficult and I'm curious about how you manage people, but I'm going to ask you later part, section. Okay. <laughs> sure, man. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, okay. Um, I'm going to, I want to ask you, how did you learn the job in, in a Japanese company? Is there any difficulties oh, yeah. or struggle? Um, thankfully, I've got a really supportive manager. I, I don't think I've come across any struggles yet, but it will be also very naive for me to say that there won't be a time where you will face those struggles because that's normal in any type of jobs. Um, but I think the, the key part being in my role is to establish a psychological safety net. So I'll, I should be the first one to say, I don't know, right? Or I should be the first one to challenge the team to be honest about what, what they know, what, what they don't know. Um, and without me being the example, people won't speak. So it's okay. I, I always say it's like being a product manager or being a product leader, right? Like, um, if something doesn't go well, typically the fingers go back to us, but if something goes well, it goes to the team, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so I think that I, I'm not, I don't, I'm not a believer that a product manager should be a CEO of product. I think that mentality is wrong. Yeah, that's um, true. That's because, true. Because like running the startup, you need co-founders. So you need to feel, you need to make the team feel like they're co-founders. Mm-hmm. right yeah um so maybe it's just my the way how i was uh, brought up in in the australian culture we don't we don't really like hierarchies like we we want to make sure that there's a very flat layer in terms of how we make decisions but i'll put some framework around how decisions are being made for example um i'm a big fan of um ray dalio ray dalio's way of um decision-making framework where yes you you want people inside the room to have a voice so you make sure everyone even the quietest people have a chance to voice out their opinion i think that's very important Mm -hmm. but not everyone should have an equal voice because the context of the conversation means that there would be some people who have a high believability because maybe it's either their subject matter expert or they had a high history of getting things right right then maybe those voices at the end of the day will count a little bit more than the other voices in the room. But at least you need to listen to all data points uh, in the room before you make a decision. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the type of culture I like working in. And that's the type of culture I, I, I strive to, to bring forward into the team that I'm working in now at Work from Planet Holdings. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. So... Um, have you ever experienced like culture shock in the company? Like pe- pe- half of people are Japanese and half of people are <laughs> from other countries, right? Yeah, it's kind of mixed shock. mixed culture. Um, I I think like no, not not yet. Um, I don't think, or even when I was working in Singapore, Hong Kong, I don't think I've come across culture shock. Mm-hmm. In fact, I I really like the fact that every kind of nationality brings something different. For example, it's uh, cherry blossom season right now. Yeah. And, uh, and I remember on one of our Slack channels, someone posted, oh yeah, we, we're going to a place around NASA. I think no, I could be wrong, but I think it's called NASA. And, uh, and then another person jumped on and said, oh yeah, you need to check out this on sand. It's, it's amazing. It's a, like a thousand year old kind of thing. And that's not culture shock. shock. This is like, things and I was just like pinching myself it's like wow if I was working in another country let alone the country I'm in now I may not even be able to observe these type of conversations right you kind of like 
now I can be a fly on the wall and, 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 and not only be that fly, but can actually be involved in these type of conversations. That's amazing. Um, and it's one of the things that I think helped me to grow in my career because I, I'm trying to open my eyes a little bit more. I'm trying to be empathetic across different people a lot more. And that helps me to build better products. I really do think so. Um, okay. and, and because if you stay in one place, it's very easy to get confident or overconfident because you know that market very well or you know the competitive landscape very well. But you, you tend to forget about the theoretical side of building product and you just rely on your gut feel. And I think that's very dangerous. Um, so, so yeah, like working in a new market actually forced me to be a learner just like you. Just like, it's like switching to a completely different career. But I, I love the feeling of just uh, being a beginner again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's interesting. All right, all right. So, okay, let's jump right into the next topic, uh, which is about, uh, but it might be not a good topic, but about language. Oh, yeah, go for it. So yeah, everything's so, on the table. It's yeah, good. you're working in a Japanese company, and yeah. do you feel do you feel a language barrier so far? Um, not really. I think I'm very lucky that they've been quite patient with me. Um, firstly, and and the even the Japanese um, colleagues that I'm working with, um, they're very happy to um, use English to talk to me. In fact, I feel ashamed that I don't know enough Japanese to be able to convey some of my expressions in Japanese because I, I've also been through that phase, right? Because I, I was born in Hong Kong, but I didn't know a single word of, well, I didn't really know a lot of English when I was nine years old, when I moved to Sydney. So I started from scratch. So I've been through those, what, what they call ESL classes, like English as a second language classes. So those are the classes where in primary school, you get plucked out from classroom and you get into this special room. It's quite good, actually, but, but they, you get assigned a, a teacher where they teach you very basic English. I learned a lot of my very basic English when I was a, a very young in Australia through just watching children's show, right? Because that, that's where you start. And, and, and it's not until a few years later, you, your brain just something click. So I'm very mindful of the fact that I also need to be very patient um, with anybody I meet. Um, but... I think uh, Woven Planet being a company that where the English language is the primary language, mm. it, it's it's very easy for me, mm. um, I would say. And that was a and that was a big surprise. Okay. Uh, I didn't know what to expect. Yeah, that was a really big surprise. Okay, so even Japanese people are talking in English, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. Do, do you feel any any struggles with communication in English to with Japanese people? Uh, no, um, but I've learned to be patient because I find Japanese, um, when I interact with a lot of my Japanese colleagues, uh, you need to give them time to think and translate the words in their brain, Yeah, right? Yeah. You need to watch out for those pauses because sometimes they pause. It doesn't mean they finish what they want to say, like yeah. sometimes because they're just processing in there, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I learned to be a little bit more patient um, in my listening. And because I'm a little bit of an extrovert, sometimes I jump really quickly into a conversation and try to interject. But maybe that's perceived as rude in Japanese culture, right? I need to actually be quiet and, and make sure the other person has finished the sentence before I respond. So yeah, those those are just uh, small things like that I pick up that I need to improve. Um, but other than that, uh, I, I'm looking forward to also be able to have daily conversations in Japanese because um, it helps them to feel more comfortable mm -hmm. when you open your conversation in the language of their you know of their first their first choice language, their native language, mm -hmm. and uh, it helps me to to be um to be perceived as also as empathetic to to what they have to say so if they don't know certain words and say hey that's okay say in japanese like 
like maybe I can understand, right? Like that's really cool. And and I, I hope they can do that to me too, because I'll, I'll come across a word where oh, I don't know the Japanese, you know, <laughs> but then they say, it's okay, Eric, you know, say in English and I can, you know, figure it out. You know, I think it goes both ways. So uh, I, I, I do need to put in some effort to learn the Japanese language. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I really love your mind. Okay. So, <laughs> so you, you don't, I, basically you don't speak Japanese on a daily basis, right? Oh, so I learned Japanese for two years when I was in high school. So in Australia, I, one thing that I like about Australian schools is that um, in both primary and high school, it's part of our curriculum, mandatory curriculum. We need to learn a second language. So it's either, I remember French, Italian, Greek, uh, or Latin, I think it's Latin. And then um, uh, Japanese. There wasn't a lot of Mandarin classes. I remember that there were some, um, and I picked Japanese mm -hmm. um, because when you're young, you grew up with manga, you grew up with anime, you, you're very aware of the culture. Um, you want to be part of it. And, and when I was growing up in the 90s, Japan was awesome, right? It was exporting a lot of the cultural um, uh, um, uh, themes and, 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 and music and, and movies and TV shows. It was all like, at least in Asia anyway, in Australia to some extent, it was all from Japan. So you want to be part of that. Nowadays, maybe it's Korean as well, but... Um, but I think, uh, yeah, I, I found the language is quite cool. I like the fact that it's got a very, very simple alphabet, right? So I learned how to read hiragana and katakana, but it doesn't mean I know the words. And <laughs> the one good thing about me learning Japanese is that at least I know the kanji because mm -hmm. I, know, I know how to read and, and write and speak um, Cantonese and Chinese. So that, mm -hmm. that helps me to understand the, the I... meanings sometimes just from reading it. But I'll probably get the grammar wrong. Uh, so yeah, it's a it's a work in progress. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. So ah, uh, so you can you can speak Chinese? Yeah, I uh, I, I went to Chinese school when I was young, when I was in Australia. Mm. So when all the kids were out playing on the weekend, like I, I went to Chinese schools. Oh, so okay. but thank thankfully, my parents kind of made me do that because. Um, it has helped me. It has mm -hmm. helped me so much working in Singapore and Hong Kong, being able to read the language, and 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 know how to speak in that language. So uh, that helps a lot. Yeah, that's yeah. I think that's a bit huge advantage. Like, uh, yes. you can speak if you can speak Chinese, you can yeah, definitely read Japanese kanji, right? Definitely, because yeah, kanji is uh, I think the most difficult difficult thing to learn <laughs> Japanese, right? I, I'm the opposite. I think. But the thing is, it's also difficult for me to learn how to pronounce it. Mm. Um, yeah, so, um, uh, but I know, I, I, I roughly know the meaning just by mm. looking at the country. Okay, next topic is, um, what's it like working as a head of product? And this is my favorite question. And I'm really curious about your career and work. Right. Uh, I don't uh, know, because like, uh, uh, I think head of product is kind of great job, like top of the, like, I feel like the top of the product <laughs> and like, yeah, CEO. <laughs> I, uh, I can tell you it's not the case. Um, it's definitely not a CEO job. Um, I think a head of product actually have a large responsibility. Firstly, you need to build a product team that can support the company, right? Because head of product is no longer someone that, you're not an individual contributor, but you need to um, know how to marry the company goal with um, a, a development roadmap and also parity. So I think being able to uh, understand the business is uh, definitely very helpful, right? You need to be quite entrepreneurial in product, but all the, all, all, also at the same time, um, I, I strive to be a product leader where I also understand the feasibility of implementing the product because, um, again, that, that's where I said you have a natural advantage over your peers because you've been through both worlds, right? I also have a software engineering background in me, so I can empathize with the technologist when they say, uh, uh, I've got that much, we've got that much tech debt that we need to reduce, but 
you know, the timeline is like this. No, we can't deliver the new features without cutting down the tech debt, right? But if you don't have that technical knowledge, sometimes it's hard to understand why you need to do that in the first place, right? So I strive to also be um, someone who can uh, um, communicate well with the technologists in the team and the engineering side of the team. Um, but uh, the most important responsibility of head of product is actually looking after the customers. Mm. Yeah. I, I think as the head of product, you need to be able to uh, convey the, the pain points and what the customer really need. Um, right. You need to be obsessed with the customer, but be, be able to communicate in a way and distill it in a way that engineers actually understand that aspects of the customer designers actually understand the aspects of the, the data scientists understand why we think that this particular pain point is going to be the differentiator or this is the moat for the product that we want to build to protect to protect our ip for example um and and yeah it's it's a lot of the time is actually being able to tell a good story actually helps to be a product leader mm -hmm. because ultimately you're the person you you know i'm responsible for doing that job not just the ceo not just the marketing team not just you know any type of customer facing teams but i also need to be able to tell why our product is so great and why our product actually fits into that person's life and why our product will be able to do more than what the users expect us to do like in their you know day to day or in their sort of context of of their needs um but at the same time i need to do the same i need to evangelize the reason why a product team exists mm -hmm. and why why we need to spend you know or invest so many years of our career building this product because everyone in the team is investing the career into this particular vision so i think that that part is very important you know, for my day-to-day -day job. But, it is, I, but I think the other sort of um, more boring aspects of the day-to-day -day job is not just managing, you know, budget, costs, resources, but also managing expectations, right, from, say, my, my stakeholders, um, expectations from other teams, such as when you work with marketing, brand, or communications, like how do you convey your needs, but at the same time um, be able to understand you know, their roadmap so that you can integrate the two, two roadmaps together. Um, working, obviously, with a lot of other teams like your security teams, right? Like mm -hmm. people don't think about those uh, with governance teams, um, making sure like what we're doing actually, you know, fits within the policy of the company. Mm -hmm. um, those, those kind of responsibilities actually don't change much from company to company. Um, I'm pretty sure if you talk to other similar people, they would say it's around the same. Um, but being able to do all that within the context of the culture and mission and vision of the company, I think that's very important for any head of products. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. So um, is there a product manager in your co company? So, I mean, um, I'm, asking, I'm asking this because... Um, um, it seems like really similar the the job role of product manager and your job role. So uh, I'm curious about uh, is there any difference between product manager and pro head of product? Ah yes, um, there will be product managers in the team. We have product managers slash tech leads in the team, but I'm building out. Uh, a more dedicated sort of product function for the company right now. So yes, there will be uh, product managers in the team. Um, you're right. Like it really comes into comes down to how mature the company is. When the company is smaller, right? I think that there's definitely some overlaps between what product manager and a product manager manager of the product managers actually do, right? But as it gets bigger. Um, what's the responsibility going to differ is I need to look at the entire ecosystem of the product and be able to build uh, a roadmap that actually uh, helps the company to achieve the goals. Whereas each of the product managers really will look into how their own product feature fit into the wider roadmap because they need to justify the resources and investment, right? But at the same time, they need to think about how did they iterate through the bills and, and, 
think about and 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 typically that's the hardest part is how did they actually collect the, the user data to to justify their backlog to justify the roadmap whereas for me i'll have to operate a little bit higher and think about the entire product strategy you know in first second and third horizon how do we build towards that long-term goal so yeah naturally as the team grows and as the team scales the responsibility will you know i can't be so in that particular slightly lower level in the detail because you need to defer that to the other team members and you trust them to make good decisions right mm. um, but uh that's that's kind of like the, the the difference between say a head of product or maybe a director of product versus a product manager product managers that were in uh tech leads position now i'm uh, in the process of actually mm-hmm. um opening up a couple of product manager positions in in the company to build that function now from scratch okay so you're yeah. planning uh, the the roadmap and um t- tell the product manager to, to build something for a realize the roadmap right correct yeah so need to firstly build a team so there's mm-hmm. a hiring strategy in place okay. and then um I need to actually kick in and actually build a longer roadmap, right? A, a higher level roadmap so that when the product manager comes in and there's difference of business domains where they will own, they can build on top of that higher level roadmap and, and justify, uh, be able to justify why they think those particular product features are going to help us to get to our mm-hmm. North Star metric. You know? Okay, so, so you have huge responsibility and I think it's, it's kind of tough work work yeah <laughs> i can easily it's part of the role <laughs> yeah i can easily imagine the, how tough it is you know to make roadmap is kind of a uh, super tough thing i think because like uh, you need to explain why i make this made this roadmap and so and so you need to know much about comp- competitors and market and yep. Uh, yeah, other uh, a lot of things, you know. So, yeah, it's kind of super tough thing. And, <laughs> yeah. So, and I'm curious about so, what is the toughest thing uh, as a head of product? Um, the most challenging aspects of my day to day is definitely people, because you need to motivate the team. And um, when you manage people, there's a lot of unexpected situations that come up, right? And and sometimes you need to deal with them quite reactively um, as much as you don't want to. Um, so yeah, like I think managing people and managing their growth, right? You need to also think about how do they, how how to help them to develop their career, uh, not just the product, because that would be a very selfish thing to do. Um, that's definitely, I think, the, always the most challenging part. Um, but thankfully, I've got a team that I can really rely upon. Like, I, don't, I can't remember a place where I worked in where I don't have a super awesome team. So I, I'm, I've been very lucky. Mm-hmm. I haven't had any sort of difficult people in my team that I had to deal with. Um, but certainly there's difficult, difficult situations, right? As much as the team is great, but you can't, you, you, they have other life events that you just can't plan and you need to be able to work around those. Um, and then the second bit is managing the growth of the team. I think there's an art around when you actually hire. I think that's also been very important. You don't want to hire too early because when people come in too early, they might have a very high expectation around what they can do straight away, but then they come in and say, oh, hang on a minute, it's all quite empty here. And 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 they get lost, right? And at the mm. same time, you don't want to hire too late. Um, that's definitely the worst of the two, I would say. Uh, yeah, because um, yeah, uh, when things get very stressful and hectic, um, that's not necessarily the environment that's going to be very welcoming for new joiners. Um, and then people may get very impatient, right, for a new joiner when they're very stressed. So that's not something that I want to create either. So those are the two most challenging thing of being uh, a people leader. Mm, okay and so um, plus people are um, from different com- countries and they have uh, different cultures and values yes. right 
So yeah, I can I can imagine how to <laughs> manage people like this, <laughs> like that. Yeah. Ah, the the trick I use is um, so so yeah, I know what you mean. You have to be able to get the team to see past just the appearance and the background. And that's actually the same, even if you say hire a team of locals, right? Where, mm. you work, where you're living in, you just hire a team of locals, there's no foreigners. But the team, you still need to have a you know, diversity of age, diversity of gender, and a diversity of a lot of different backgrounds, right? Um, and I, I represent the LGBT sort of community. I'm also very aware of the responsibility I have to promote a diversity a diverse team, right? Um, so that when when people understand that that's the key ingredient to success, or actually is more of a risk management ingredient, if you like, um, then they naturally will embrace that and they make it easy for that person actually leading the team, even though everyone is from different culture, um, um, they do appreciate that they uh, in that environment they can they can actually work more freely because there's no cultural pretense anymore right like if you have a one team of one culture then there's a lot of rules and systems that that culture dictates it's actually more rigid to mm -hmm. work in that environment than working in a team where you've got different cultures and different backgrounds yeah okay, i think I've, it's going to be the last question so sure. what is <laughs> um what is the most exciting thing about head of product? What is the most exciting thing about head of product? Hmm. I think the most exciting thing for me always is being able to recruit amazing people that you see them grow in the team mm -hmm. while at the same time delivering incredible value to the customers. Mm -hmm. Like if I was just bringing a team that, um, improves the lives of the customer, then I'm just being an average head of product, I think, or even just an average product leader of any type. Um, because that's the responsibility of every single product manager out there is to improve the lives of the users, right? But if I can do that in conjunction of improving um, the career and the economic security of my team, right? so that they themselves, they will have families and all that type of thing. If I can contribute a little bit of that, I get a lot more joy out mm -hmm. of it. Um, so yeah, that, that to me is the most important thing that the people that I work with feel like they also grow, have, grew, uh, have grown themselves if they look back in the last couple of months or last couple of years that they've been in the team. So, so yeah, that's, uh, that's the first thing that I thought of when you asked that question. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thank you for watching and thank you for joining us today, Eric. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure you smash the like button. And if you have any thoughts or questions, please leave the comments down below. Also, I would appreciate it if you consider subscribing to my channel. Otherwise, see you in the next video. Bye-bye.